O beth o'r arlwy a fydd gebron mewn dwy flynedd pan fyddwn ni'n dathlu yn pen blwydd a wedi cyrraedd oes yr addewid. Um, a really warm welcome to you uh, all, uh, friends of WNO, um, members of the press, uh, uh, supporters, donors, members of the Bel Canto Syndicate, uh, all of you who uh, have supported WNO over the years and are doing so uh, again today and uh, delighted to see you all here. And a welcome to, for the first time, to uh, those who are listening to this uh, press conference online. This is the first time we've done a press conference uh, online. Um, so a great welcome to uh, those, uh, those who are watching us wherever you are in the world. Um, it's a little presumptuous to uh, be talking about a 70th birthday uh, two years before that birthday, but it's in the nature of opera planning uh, uh, when it's just inescapable. Um, so uh, this is what we are doing. Uh, and of course, when we look forward to 2016 and our 70th birthday, we are actually looking back uh, to the year 1946, which was a, a remarkable year in many, many ways. Um, a great uh, flowering that took place after peace was declared. Um, WNO uh, gave its first performance on the 15th of April 1946. Um, the Llangollen International Eisteddfod opened in 1946. Uh, the Edinburgh Festival opened in 1946. Uh, so it was a remarkable year. And uh, it was the pioneers, really, who set up this company, a man called Idlois Owen, who had the courage and the confidence uh, to establish this company, not after the war, but actually in the middle of it, in December uh, 1943. So um, it's absolutely right that we should celebrate this properly uh, in 2016. Uh, and I'm going to ask uh, David Pantney, our Chief Executive and Artistic Director now, uh, to outline to you the ways, thank you, uh, the ways in which um, we hope to celebrate and to fulfill uh, the very best traditions of this company. David. Geraint, yeah, thank you very much and a very warm welcome to you all. Uh, so we are very proud actually to announce at this point and, and bearing in mind the financial circumstances under which everybody is operating at the moment, um, a really ambitious and exciting program for our 15-16 season which climaxes with our 70th birthday celebrations. And this season begins in the autumn of 2015 with a prescient uh, season entitled Music and Madness. Clearly it is madness to attempt to do opera under these circumstances but here we are, we're doing it and we're doing it I think in a very enterprising and exciting way. And that season kicks off with a new production of I Puritani uh, by Annalisa Miskimen, uh, formerly a staff director here at Welsh National Opera. This is part of our Bel Canto series. It will be conducted by Carlo Rizzi, we're delighted to say, and will also include Barry Banks and David Kempster, who you will have heard during this uh, current Rossini series. Madness continues with uh, a production that we have borrowed from Scottish opera of Handel's Orlando, uh, one of the most definitive uh, explorations of madness in, in musical literature. And that season is concluded by the utter madness of Sweeney Todd, uh, a most fantastic piece and a, and a big first for this company and this building. This is the first time, actually, that there has been an active collaboration, a, a co-production, in fact, between WMC and WNO, and we are very pleased that finally, after nearly 10 years of residency here, these two organizations are working very, very fruitfully and creatively together, and I think that brings a whole new energy onto 
the scene here in, in Wales. So that's a very important development. That production is also a collaboration with the West Yorkshire Playhouse and Manchester Exchange Theatre and will be a very exciting event for all of us here at WNO. The spring season, which follows that, is called Figaro Here, Figaro There and is a trilogy of Figaro works, all of them new productions, all within uh, a, 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 a similar scenic environment is my way of saying that it won't be exactly the same any more than, for example, William, the Tell, William Tell and uh, Mose are the same, although they are also within the same scenic environment. So this is a creative way of putting on a varied repertoire um, without spending a lot of money unnecessarily. Uh, and this will involve new productions of the Barbara Seville and the Marriage of Figaro, wonderful and very familiar pieces. And on the end of those, um, a, a completion of the trilogy uh, called Figaro inevitably gets divorced. Uh, this is partly based on Beaumarchais, who wrote a sequel called La Mer Coupable, partly based on a play by Horvath, uh, who wrote a play called Figaro Gets a Divorce, and partly a bit of fantasy of my own, as I've written the libretto for this. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce to you Elena Langer, who is going to, is in the process of composing uh, the third work. Elena, come, come and say a word to us about this. Um, it's, it's a daunting prospect to, to follow Rossini and Mozart, um. <laughs> it is it, it is very scary and uh, intimidating and uh, I, every morning when I try to write I I have to spend 20 minutes telling myself that it, you, you've got to do it there is a reason and you've got to write this thing um, uh, but it will be an independent piece there, there's not going to be any quoting or, or anything it's it's going to be an independent piece with uh, characters people love and uh, with some new new unexpected developments. Yes, I think that's the, the, the part of the charm of the piece is that it takes that group of characters who we love and treasure so much and sees them 20 years on. So they're all in different stages of life and confronting different kinds of problems. And, you know, that's, a, I think, a richness in, the, in this opportunity. Uh, yes, uh, there are some funny... Uh, Funny developments. Carabina becomes quite sleazy and fat and unattractive, <laughs> and uh, uh, and there is a, a a new character, the major, who who I quite love writing for because he's an evil character, and in each scene he causes everybody some some distress, and. Uh, I thought I should write some beautiful music for, for this character and, and make him very uh, charismatic and, 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 and interesting and, and uh, tempting <laughs> in each scene. And, and he, he, the major, will be played by Alan Oak, who I think is one of our most gifted uh, singing actors at the moment. This is, a, this is a really wonderful opportunity for him. And may I ask um, the prescient question, how far are you with the opera? How, how uh, many scenes have you done? Well, I, I already wrote a few scenes and I, and I tend not to write chronologically. I, um, I, I love the ending of, of this piece. So I think the first thing I wrote was the, the, the coda of the opera and then I wrote the ending of the first half and then when I ran out of endings to write, I, I, I started from the beginning. <laughs> and uh, I, I wrote maybe six or seven scenes. Um, something I want to tell. Ah, I, I had a, I had a nice chat with Alan uh, Oak uh, on, on the phone, and uh, he was trying to find out what I'm doing, then uh, what I'm writing, and I said I'm going to write you some tunes, and he said tunes, yes, please. <laughs> he, he seemed quite happy at the prospect. Elena, thank you, thank you, thank you very much indeed, and we're all looking forward with great excitement to this development. Mm -hmm. So then we, we come to, oh, I should just um, emphasize the, the, the author of the scenic environment for the Figaro trilogy is uh, an amazing man, a veteran theater designer, Ralph Koltai, responsible for the e &O ring uh, all those years ago, responsible for a huge swathe of incredibly influential productions at the Royal Shakespeare Company. He's 90. Um, he's a little bent. 
but his brain is as straight as a die, and uh, you know, it's been a great excitement to work with such a, a, a wonderful veteran figure of our theatre history on this, on this trilogy. Uh, that brings me to the, uh, the summer season, which is our real birthday celebration, although the actual first performance of, in '46 took place in April. We've consecrated the summer season to really celebrating the birthday, and the linchpin of this is another new commission uh, of a, a very, very important piece based on uh, a, an amazing text by the, the Welsh writer David Jones called in parenthesis, uh, in principle this is uh, a description, both factual and mystical, of his experiences as a private soldier in the First World War. He fought at the Battle of the Somme and indeed at this uh, infamous engagement at Mamet's Wood and was one of the very few survivors of that. So this is a very important historical commission, not only in celebration of our birthday, but in commemoration of that rather awesome anniversary. And we're very, very grateful to uh, welcome here this evening um, representatives of two bodies who've been very generous in their support of this uh, of, of this project. One is uh, Nick Cronk, who represents the Nicholas John Trust, and the other is Nigel Hines, who is here as a representative of the 1418 Now, which is the official government commemorative body responsible for the cultural program commemorating the First World War. And um, I also should welcome here Anne Price Owen from the David Jones Society, and a special mention to Gwyneth Petty, who is here, who is one of the people who took part in the original broadcast of In Parenthesis, and it's really an incredible honor to have you here this evening, and we're, we're very touched by, by that. So thank you for that. Uh, so I'm going to introduce you now to our, our brilliant team who gave a really inspirational presentation about this project to the company this afternoon, uh, the librettist uh, Emma Jenkins, uh, the composer Ian Bell, and David, the fellow librettist. <laughs> Dodging a problem there. <laughs> so please come and say a word, Emma, about uh, your experience and how you've managed to reduce this incredibly rich uh, text to a viable opera libretto. Well, yes, I think what's going to make our opera very exciting is that it's going to be no ordinary account of the Somme conflict. Certainly the, the basic storyline is, is very simple and one that most people will, will be very familiar with. Young men, in this case our hero, Private John Ball and his battalion, set off for France where they then press forward to the front line before finally moving south to the Somme and meeting their death. Um, however, what elevates this story to being something far greater than any other account of uh, World War I conflict is that it has this mystical and otherworldly dimension. And the way we're presenting it, and this is one of the, the way we try to sort of pick up a single thread in the massive, sprawling, epic poem that is, that is David Jones's in parenthesis, we asked ourselves what, what one single thread could we pick up and work on. And for us, it was simply the idea that we could present the opera as an Orphic rite of passage, and that our hero, John Ball, was a 20th century Orpheus who undergoes a journey into the wasteland of war and then emerges miraculously alive after an ordeal that really ought to have uh, ended in certain death. And then on this journey, he encounters two very distinct levels of experience. The first, obviously, is the very visceral experience of, of conflict, but the second is this otherworldly, hallucinatory, parallel universe that he involuntarily dips in and out of throughout. And it's a world where our battalion can magically morph from being modern soldiers into suddenly becoming 6th century Britonic warriors or men at Agincourt or Arthur's knights seeking the grail. And I think the other thing that we have, David and I, have really tried to work on is that the end of the piece is incredibly positive. Certainly at the very end, when they meet their death in Mamet's Wood at the Somme, in the words of the poem, everybody you have ever heard of is dead. However, an incredible thing happens at the end. The Queen of the Woods, um, who lives in Mamet's Wood, mystically appears, 
and she bestows a special flower on every man slain. And in doing so, she actually gives rebirth to the woodland. The decimated woodland is regenerated, refructified, and the men are reborn as part of nature itself. And we really hope that the audience go away with a, that tremendous sense of transcendence and upliftment. And I think David is going to read to us a little bit of this. Do you want to just introduce... Yeah, David's going to read a little section from the very end of the libretto. So the setting is in Mamet's Wood, at the very end, in the Somme, Everybody is dead except John Ball, and as he's walking amongst the carnage, he receives a gunshot wound to the leg. It doesn't kill him, it's not a fatal wound, but he, he's encumbered by it, he's weighed down by his rifle, and he engages in a dialogue with one of the mystical figures who, who is part of this parallel universe. Should he leave his rifle behind? Should he carry it out of the wood? Um, the, the Bard of Britannia, who he's talking with, persuades him to leave the rifle as a votive offering at the Sacred Oak. And that votive gesture summons the Queen of the Woods, who then bestows her special blessing. So David's going to read from that. Midnight. Spirits slip lightly from the broken bodies of sick men. The severed head of Sergeant Snell grins like a Cheshire cat. Anybody you have ever heard of is dead. And to Private Ball the shot came as if a rigid beam of great weight flailed above his calves. Below, below, below. You've got no legs to stand on. Warm fluid percolates between your toes. Your left boot fills. It's difficult, so difficult. The rifle weighs about my neck. Leave it under the oak. Leave it for the salvage bloke. Let it lie bruised for a monument. It's the thunder besom for us. It's the bright bough born. No, can't leave it, mustn't leave it. It's a soldier's best friend. Marry it, man, marry it, cherish her. She's your very own, coax her, man. Coaxer. Slung so, its weight pulls you down. Slung so, it hangs at your neck like the mariner's sacrifice. Talk to her. Fondle her. You've known her hot and cold. But leave it. Let it lie for the Jews to rust it. Leave it under the oak. White trefoils spring beneath her feet. I give to each, to all, bright flowering boughs. My hands pluck forth for each a fragile prize, diadems for secret princes in the leaning trees. For Watson, white berries, for waste bottom, red. For you, old friend, a curious crown of golden saxifrage. Sweet briar for snell and daisies on a chain. Talks of plaited splendour for Mr. Jenkins. Piers Dorian Isambard Jenkins, whose own the sheep are. Lance Corporal and Irene Lewis, who sleeps in the chalk, a rowan sprig for him. But where is Dye Greatcoat? I have a very special one for Dye, a golden bow for Dye to fructify the land. I give to each, to all, bright flowering boughs. My hands pluck forth for each a fragile prize. And those who were on this field, those between the high trees, those on the open down, they shall reign with me for a thousand years. So this uh, incredible story of slaughter and war ends with these beautiful Shakespearean redemptive sentiments. Uh, and thank you, David, for, for doing that. Ian, come and tell us a little bit about how you're going to deal with these two worlds, the real world and the fantasy world. Yeah, there's a real dichotomy. Um, I have this militaristic, really martial world that, that is 
portrayed with brass, with heavy timpani, and all that you'd expect. I then, as you've heard, have an ethereal astral world of people that are watching this from afar, as if a, a distant memory. And I get to portray this in a high fantasy, in a, in a very esoteric, in a very quasi-astral way. And to, to answer that, both orchestrally and vocally has, has been the greatest challenge because these two worlds exist, this martial and this ethereal world exist very happily side by side. Very occasionally do they, do they inflect on one another. Um, but then in the second act, I then get to merge them all, bring them together and create this uber fantasy epic world. And that's it's just been the most amazing experience to be able to fashion this, this newness, this new sound. And, and vocally, um, I've, I've, the, the WNO chorus played one of the most central roles within this. I have created for them no less than a choral overture, two hymns, two carols, an anthem, a folk song, and they end with the Salve Regina. It's a big ask, it's a big ask, but knowing what they've recently done with Moses and Aaron, they're completely up to it, and it's been a joy to create a work for a company, for, for a group of people who are so musical and so dramatically inspired with such instincts. And then also being able to portray this, this, this world on, on this, young sarge, this young private ball, who is at once clumsy and like Frank Spencer and awkward, and then at the other moment, he's seeing these visions of imagine, imagining he's being chased by hounds. And I thought, well, what can I do different here? What, what can I do different vocally? Because I, I'm used to portraying altered states in my operas. My first opera charted the downfall of a syphilitic prostitute in Hogarthian London. Done. My second opera, which opens in Houston uh, this December, is A Christmas Carol. I've had to portray ghosts, Ebenezer Scrooge. A different state of being here, I get to explore an otherworldliness as yet uncharted and I thought well how do I answer this vocally um, yes with the chorus I have these wonderful set pieces but in, in the lead character of Ball I thought what's never been done in contemporary opera is the exploration of the Rossini tenor voice we have so many contemporary operas with blazing coloratura sopranos almost as a cliche but to portray this, this otherworldliness this otherness Within, within this young soldier, uh, I thought, I'm going to take all that dexterity, all that suppleness, and, and all that melisma that the Rossini tenor has, subvert it, make it my own, bring it into my own, my own language, and create something really fresh. And I really hope that I've done that with this character and with this role, because it's something very special, and we really feel for this clumsy little puppy dog who, who is haunted by these visions. And in it, we've got the outstanding American tenor, as you'll see in your program notes, Alex Schrader, who will be creating this role, which is a dream come true to be writing for a singer so, so gifted, as it is for the WNO chorus. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, thank you very much. Well, we, that's, a, that's a gallop through uh, what I hope is going to be a, a riveting and exciting and creative uh, year of work for this really wonderful company uh, which I think whatever you think about any of our individual decisions uh, deserves your fullest support as an institution and that's something that's really very important to me and I think you should all be aware that every arts organization is on a campaign for survival from here on in and I would urge all of those of you who have a voice anywhere to use that voice because uh, nobody wants to hear us pleading for our existence. They want to hear other people pleading for our existence. Uh, and you are part of that and I welcome you to that responsibility. Um, so that's the end of our formal presentation. Uh, we are of course available now for individual questions and because we are going into individual questions we will be uh, leaving our live stream. So thank you very much to all those of you who watched that live stream and took part in it. Um, but we're going to leave you now and take any questions there may be from the floor. <laughs>